Hello everybody. Today I am going to talk to you about heart disease in women. If I can figure out how to advance my slide. I'd like to give a shout out for National Heart Health Awareness Month. That is February. I hope all of you wore your red on Friday the 4th, which is Go Red for Women Day. And it is the National Heart, I'm sorry, American Heart Association's um, campaign to raise awareness of heart disease in women. A little bit about me. I have no disclosures pertaining to this talk. But who am I really? Sorry, I have to time this. I was born and grew up in a very small town in Central Michigan. I did my undergrad at Michigan State University and was uh, pre-med in an accelerated uh, math and science program there. I then moved to Colorado after graduation. Well, I worked briefly for about a year in a clinical lab, and then I moved to Colorado where I did uh, basic science work uh, in a neurology lab at the University of Colorado. You might find it interesting that I also uh, bartended at uh, various bars and restaurants around the Denver area. I then matriculated into a small osteopathic school in the San Francisco Bay Area and therefore moved to California. I spent the first two years of medical school when you're really doing all your um, book work and testing in the Bay Area and then I actually moved to Las Vegas. I did my third year of uh, clinicals over there and then packed everything I owned into my small frontier pickup truck and moved around the country for about a year, going to various places like the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic, University of Cincinnati, Beaumont and Detroit. Then I graduated medical school from California and moved to Michigan where I lived in downtown Detroit, which was very different than the Central Michigan area where I grew up. I did an internship at Henry Ford Hospital before I moved back to Colorado to do the rest of my postgraduate training at the University of Colorado. I completed a second internship, internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship, and clinical cardiac electrophysiology fellowship all at the University of Colorado. Finally, in 2010, after 12 years of medical training and 29 total years of schooling dating back to kindergarten, I moved to Oklahoma to put it all to work and practice medicine. I was an employed electrophysiologist at a local hospital. I did that for about six years, and I won't really get on my soapbox as to why the conventional chronic disease care pill for an ill, do as many procedures on as many people as possible model did not really jive with my ethics, but suffice it to say, I got out of employment and went into private practice. I initially joined a multi-specialty group, which ultimately also did not align with my ethics. And so I spent a couple of years trying to get out of that mess. Serendipitously throughout this process, I discovered functional medicine. Functional medicine is a root cause approach to a person's health care. Our goal is to restore normal biochemistry and physiology such that a person does not end up with a laundry list of diagnosis codes, which then obligate me to give this list of pharmaceuticals. Functional medicine is actually what I was naive enough to believe that all of medicine was nearly 20 years prior when I embarked on that journey. I spent three years doing intensive training and certification in functional medicine. On Valentine's Day three years ago, I opened uh, Bargus Wellness and I became the only cardiologist in the state of Oklahoma to be certified in functional medicine in October of 2020. So what is integrative cardiology? Integrative medicine is a healing-oriented medicine that takes into account the whole person, including all aspects of their lifestyle, and it emphasizes the therapeutic relationship between me and my patient. Functional medicine is those things that I just outlined. It's really a root cause approach to the pathology and health of a patient. Conventional cardiology is more diagnosis-oriented. It's reactive. There's not as much prevention as there should be, and it's really chronic disease care in this modern world, unfortunately. 
integrative cardiology with a functional medicine foundation is actually root cause oriented. I focus on prevention and reversal of pathology and it's really healthcare. I'm trying to restore the optimal health of my patient. So let's move on and talk about heart disease because that's what we're all here about today. Is heart disease still a problem for women? Well, if you consider the leading cause of death in females, killing about 300,000 of us per year in the US a problem, then yes. Cancer is uh, slowly catching up to us, uh, or catching up to cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of death in women. This is all cause cancer, not just one kind of cancer. The term heart disease refers to several different types of heart conditions, including coronary artery disease and heart attack. And although heart disease is sometimes thought of a man's disease, almost as many women as men die each year of heart disease in the United States. This graph here shows that most counties in Oklahoma are in the highest level of heart disease in the United States. We are not a healthy state here in Oklahoma. The American Heart Association reports that one in three women have some form of heart disease. They say that it claims the lives, the life of a woman every 80 seconds. But there's hope because they also say that 80% of it is preventable. So what can we do about it? I love this cartoon. We found a bunch of these clogging your arteries. They're cholesterol pills. That doesn't really happen, by the way. Today, we're going to take a tour through my functional approach to a patient's cardiovascular health. We're going to talk about nutrition, movement, stress resiliency, sleep, and other modifiable factors. So first, it starts with nutrition. If you cannot somehow manage to eat right, I can do all the other things of functional medicine, and I will never be able to optimize your health. It starts with what you do and what you do not eat. Ways to my heart. Buy me food. Make me food. Be food. I love food. I'm a total foodie. So is this guy here. This is Dr. Mark Hyman. If you want to know all there is necessary to know about food, you can just memorize this book. He is one of the fathers of functional medicine, and he wrote this excellent book to clarify a lot of confusing misconceptions and dispel some myths about food. It's an excellent resource. He also has a cookbook that goes along with it. You can see him shopping here in the produce section of the grocery store. He teaches that with few exceptions, if something has a food label on it, you probably should not be eating it. And he talks a lot about shopping the perimeter of your supermarket. What does that mean? Here you can see the standard setup of typical grocery store with all the um, fresh foods, uh, vegetables, meats, dairy around the outside and all these rows and rows of processed refined food that we in functional medicine affect affectionately call franken foods filling up the middle of the grocery store if you stay out here around the surface you'll already be doing yourself an amazing favor so why does food matter obesity is an epidemic that has created a global health crisis and food substance foods or substances that the food industry wants us to believe are food are actually what cause obesity according to the who report in 2007 their update on obesity they uh, claimed that worldwide obesity had nearly tripled since 1975. This chart is a little bit newer, taken from data in 2019 showing obesity prevalence um, by country. And you can see that down here, the United States, we're right at the top. This um, larger uh, bar here just relates to the fattest states in our country. Yes, here in the US, we are the winner. This um, graph here shows that less than 25 years ago, there wasn't a single state in the US with an obesity rate over 20%. As of 2019, which is where this pink um, picture data comes from, there wasn't a single state with an obesity rate under 20%. Even Colorado, our healthiest state. In 2020, 42.4% of American adults were obese, an increase of 26% since 2008. And this was the first time that the national rate had passed the 40% mark. So what does that have to do with our heart? 
Well, excess weight increases the risk of many health problems, including type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure, which are two of the major risk factors for heart disease. It also just flat out increases heart disease and stroke among these um, other conditions listed here. This guy is saying, if you are what you eat, I'd rather be thin like a french fry than round like a head of lettuce. And that mentality has got us to where we are. And unfortunately, it's causing us to live shorter lives. There was a steady, gradual increase you can see here in um, our lifespan from dating from the 1960s um, up until about 2014 when a decline steadily occurred until 2018. We held steady um, for a year or so, but then in the first half of 2020 with the onset of the pandemic, the life expectancy dropped by a year in females and a year and a half in males. So why at this time of most advanced medical technology and pharmaceutical development are we dying younger? The things we accomplish in conventional medicine today are astounding. People are even smoking less, yet our life expectancy continues to decline. The truth is that technology simply cannot compete with the standard American diet. I love to quote Dr. Hyman when he says, most Americans don't eat food anymore. They eat factory made, industrially produced, food-like substances, or frankenfoods, that contain trans fats, high fructose corn syrup, MSG, artificial sweeteners and color colors, additives, preservatives, pesticides, antibiotics, new to nature protein and heightened allergens caused by genetic breeding and engineering. Yummy. Do not eat the sad standard American diet. As we move into talking specifically about diets and food, I need to dispel a major myth. Eating fat does not cause heart disease. It also doesn't make you fat. This doctor is telling his patient, that high carb diet I put you on 20 years ago, well, it gave you diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Oops. How did this myth come to be and how did fat become so vilified? This is some uh, old data. In 1970, Ansel Keys, the scientist, released the hallmark data implicating saturated fat as the cause of heart disease, which is shown here on the left graph. As fat calories increase, then so does one's risk of heart disease, no matter what age. But as this graph shows you, what he didn't say is that they could have just as easily implicated sugar with these solid circles being fat and these open circles being consumption of sugar. Countries eating higher amounts of fat were simultaneously eating more sugar. It was just a question of what you were looking for. Further investigation into the study methods and data collection found that the authors actually classified foods, which are primarily refined carbohydrates, as saturated fat. The UK and the National Institute of Clinical Excellence still classify foods like biscuits, cakes, pastries, and savory snacks as saturated fat rather than refined carbohydrate and sugar, which is exactly how they're processed in the body. Studies of more than 600,000 people in 19 countries have found no link between saturated fat consumption and heart disease. That reference is listed here for all of you doubters who would like to go to the literature yourselves. Ansel Keys' data led to some very misguided guidelines, including the crazy food pyramid that's actually upside down. Within just a year, these data were brought into question by many trials, but the low-fat, high-carb fad was going full force, backed by companies like Kellogg's, Nestle, General Mills, and Quaker, as well as the policy and guideline builders like the National Cholesterol Education Program and even the National Institute of Health and my very own American Heart Association. There was no going back and look at what the recommendations to limit fat consumption and worse yet to substitute high processed sugar laden, low fat foods and polyunsaturated fatty acids for meat due to the prevalence of obesity up, up, up. And the number of hospital hospitalizations for coronary heart disease up, up, up. The next myth is that vegetable, the next myth I'd like to dispel now is that vegetable oil is somehow better for you than animal fat. That is simply not true and numerous studies have proven it. 
back in the 70s, there was this very interesting study. It was completely unethical, and it was done in a mental sanatorium and paid for by the government. And basically, they swapped the, the people, the patients there, like, had no control over their food, right? And so they swapped the saturated fat in half the patient's diet with polyunsaturated fat. For you who don't know what that is, that's basically vegetable oil and um, soybean oil and corn oil and, and grapeseed oil and all these highly refined um, oils. What they found is that the polyunsaturated fatty acid diet had worse outcomes, not only from uh, coronary heart disease, but they also had more cancer. These data were actually buried in somebody's basement because if they had been released to the general population, um, that would have been very disruptive to the mainstream. It would have actually cost the government a lot of money because by this time there were major subsidies going into corn crops and soybean crops to send all over the world. Some whistleblower ultimately like dug this data out and it ended up being published in the uh, British Medical Journal in 2016. Very interesting and scandalous. Do not eat highly processed and refined polyunsaturated fatty acid. It's completely, completely toxic. So what the heck should we eat? There's so many diets. Mediterranean, paleo, keto, pescatarian, plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, dairy-free. Next up, somebody's going to find out how to have the food-free one. This shark, he's reading a book on the keto diet, and he says, I think it'll be okay as long as we don't eat the buns. By far and away, without question, the diet most supported in the literature for the prevention and uh, treatment of cardiovascular disease is the Mediterranean diet. I've listed a ton of studies here. I'm going to highlight just a couple of them for you. This squirrel says, did you know high nut consumption is associated with lower cardiovascular related and all cause mortality? Do you think I eat these things because they taste good? I actually love nuts. The Lionheart study was the largest secondary prevention uh, trial looking at the Mediterranean diet. They um, looked at uh, several thousand patients and these patients, it's a secondary prevention trial, so basically what that means is that everybody had already had um, some sort of cardiac event and they were trying to prevent the next one. And they randomized them to the Mediterranean diet which included uh, increased fruits and vegetables, nuts, olive oil, canola oil, and fish, and it to randomize, uh, compared that to a prudent American Heart Association Step 1 diet, which is decreased fat, decreased saturated fat, and decreased cholesterol intake. And they followed them for um, five years, and what they found is that it was 13% less recurrent cardiovascular events, myocardial infarction, and stroke in the Mediterranean diet group. The PREDIMED study is the largest primary prevention study, and this means they were looking at people that didn't yet have cardiovascular disease, but they were at high risk for cardiovascular disease. Over 7,000 people, half of them were women, they were middle-aged, 58 to 80 years, and they followed them for five years. They randomized them to a Mediterranean diet supplemented with nuts or extra virgin olive oil. This was very controlled. They actually measured parameters in the blood to show that they were eating the olive oil. Um, they compared these to a control diet during which the patients were advised to reduce dietary fat intake. What they found is both of the Mediterranean diets had less heart attacks, stroke, and cardiovascular death than the control diet subjects. Why is the Mediterranean diet so great? It's low glycemic, means it does, meaning it does not promote insulin resistance and diabetes. It's very high in fiber, which is excellent for glucose control, blood pressure, and a healthy microbiome. It's rich in many therapeutic foods, including anti-inflammatory omega-3 and omega-9 fats, um, such as an, uh, the smash fish, olives, and avocados. Those of you who are not familiar with smash fish, that stands for sardines, mackerel, anchovies, salmon, and herring. These are the healthiest fishes to eat. If they're um, a wild caught, they contain the least amount of toxins and the highest amount of beneficial omega-3s. 
Avocados are a superfood for the heart. I love this picture. It reminds me to tell you about a study that compared markers of inflammation in individuals who ate a plain hamburger compared to those who ate a hamburger with a half of an avocado on it, and it found that the avocado-laden burger prevented much of the inflammation that occurred um, compared to eating the hamburger alone. It includes lots of nuts, which include phytochemicals like plant sterols and blo that block intestinal absorption of cholesterol. It uh, includes lots of onion, garlic, and tomatoes, which provide medicinal, medicinal compounds that reduce inflammation and lessen oxidative stress. And it includes a lot of phytonutrients. So what are phytonutrients? This is a very busy slide. Basically, this is a list of many different uh, fruits and vegetables of all the different colors of the rainbow. And here are all the phytonutrients, these beneficial compounds that come in each of the different colors that we eat. And they all have certain uh, biochemical um, responsibilities within uh, our system. And so it's very important to eat the rainbow. The next myth I would like to dispel is that of the whole juicing craze. Do not juice while you get all the phytonutrients in the juice. You also get all the fructose, which is the major sugar in fruits and vegetables, but you get none of the fiber. And the fiber from a fruit or vegetable are actually what allow our body to deal with the high sugar load when we eat a piece of fruit. Juicing is not healthy. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, if you have diabetes or prediabetes, you should never drink juice. You need the fiber from the fruit. Just eat the piece of fruit. I love this chart. I show it to my patients all the time. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Hypocrisy, the father of my own Hippocratic Oath actually uh, said that. And what this chart shows is all these different kinds of foods and nutrients we get through our, we get through our diet and how they have actions in our body, the same as many medications we use in cardiology, vasodilators, calcium channel blockers, these are all classes of medications that I use to treat high blood pressure. Speaking of food as medicine, let's take a minute to talk about chocolate. It is actually good for you, you'll be pleased to hear. It is rich in polyphenols and bio bioactive flavanols and a compound called theobromine, which has positive effect on the heart's blood pressure. They've actually studied this. There's been a couple different meta-analyses that show um, a diet, a relationship between consumption of dark chocolate and markers of good cardiovascular health. There was also a Finnish study that showed a decreased risk in stroke. The caveat is that it has to be 72% or darker dark chocolate. Milk chocolate is loaded with sugar and has very little health benefit, if any. This is a list of cardiac uh, superfoods. I won't read it all for you, but you can see it here. Some of my favorites are blueberries. I try to eat them every day. Chocolate, obviously, and avocados. I think avocados might be the most perfect food in the world. And here this guy is saying, you're fat, but you're good fat. So we're gonna turn now to uh, fasting. There are entire books and lectures dedicated to this. I'm just gonna touch very briefly on a couple points about fasting. I love fasting. It's called a lot of different things and a lot of different um, things that we do, we call fasting. There is truly, in the literature, there's intermittent fasting, which includes time-restricted eating or feeding, which is basically just um, lengthening the window in a 24-hour period where you don't eat and um, shortening that interval where you consume all of your calories in a day. There's alternate day fasting, which means exactly that. You eat normally on one day, and then you alternate in a various fashion uh, days in which you significantly restrict your calorie for that calorie intake for that 24-hour period. There's also the, something called the fasting mimicking diet. The most literature on the physiologic benefits of fasting are actually found with five-day water fasts. Um, it's hard to uh, do that. And um, now we have something called the fasting mimicking diet, which is actually more physiologically uh, beneficial 
than um, a five-day water fast. This is Walter Longo. He's a longevity expert at um, the University of Southern California, and he has done much of the research on the benefits of um, a five-day fast and the benefits of fasting really for longevity and um, the actual basic science uh, bench work to show what does fasting do to our physiology. He wrote this book called The Longevity Diet, and he actually um, developed the true fasting mimicking diet, which um, is uh, sold by a company called Prolon. I promote it a lot um, in my office uh, with my patients. It has actually been shown to have blood pressure improvements, decreases development of diabetes, and uh, improves longevity. I actually do the uh, five-day fasting mimicking diet twice a year myself for longevity benefit. Intermittent fasting uh, has been shown to decrease inflammatory markers. It increases BDNF, which is um, a neurotrophic factor in the brain that improves cognition. It uh, improves blood pressure. Time-restricted feeding has been shown to uh, induce weight reduction while all the while maintaining muscle mass. And alternate day fasting has literature showing that it uh, has a beneficial uh, effect on um, LDL, which is a type of cholesterol that we will talk about again in a minute. This is currently my favorite book about fasting. This is by Dave Asprey. It's called Fast This Way. Dave is the founder of the uh, Bulletproof Coffee and Bulletproof Diet craze. Um, this book walks you through incorporating fasting into your life in a completely doable way. He's also a really funny guy as he um, tells his story and his journey. It's a great book. I love it. So let's move on and talk about exercise and the crowd groans, or as I like to call it, movement, because nobody likes the word exercise, except a few of crazies. To prevent a heart attack, take one aspirin every day. Take it out for a run, then take it to the gym, then take it on a bike ride. So do we have an obesity epidemic or an inactivity epidemic? Data from 2010 revealed that in the prior 20 years, there had been a sharp decrease in physical exercise and an increase in the average BMI. Investigators theorized that the nationwide drop in leisure time activity, especially a young women, among young women, may be responsible for the upward trend in obesity rates. Obviously, it's a combination of eating the wrong foods and not moving your body. This is a very interesting um, data representation which shows the prevalence of self-reported physical activity among U.S. adults between the ages of 2015 and 18. Respondents were classified as physically inactive if they responded no to the following question. During the past month, other than your regular job, did you participate in any physical activity or exercise such as running, calisthenics, golf, gardening, or walking? for exercise. Embarrassing, again, here is Oklahoma with a third of the population not even going on a walk in the past month. Being sedentary leads to twice the risk of developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease, 13% increased risk of cancer, and 17% overall mortality risk increase. It's, there's also uh, correlations with worse blood pressure and lipids, even in children and adolescents, as well as poor self-esteem and decreased academic achievement. Sitting is definitely the new smoking. So what fits into your busy schedule better? Exercising for one hour a day or being dead for 24 hours a day? There are multiple cardiometabolic effects of exercise. There's been numerous studies uh, looking at that. I'm not going to read this list to you, but it, there's beneficial effect on the heart rate, the blood pressure, how our clotting factors work, how our blood vessels work, how our insulin and sugar is processed. Exercise has been shown to decrease the risk of many disease processes, including a 14% reduction in breast cancer, 21% reduction in colon cancer, and a 28% uh, decrease in diabetes. There's a 25 to 26% decreased risk of ischemic heart disease and ischemic stroke in those who exercise regularly. 
because of the breadth of uh, data supporting the cardiovascular benefits of exercise, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recommends that we get at least 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise weekly and that we work in some uh, resistance training as well. But what if you aren't an athlete? Hey, instead of jogging, can you just set my pacemaker to beat faster for 30 minutes a day while I watch TV? That won't work. I could do it though. If you're not an athlete, then you can just dance. Dance therapy has been shown to decrease both systolic and diastolic blood pressure in cardiac rehab patients. It, de it increases VO2 max. It increases lower body muscle power. It increases balance. It's as effective as walking in improving cardiovascular risk and fall risk in healthy older women. So engaging in any type of intervention, be it dancing, walking, stretching, induces metabolic improvements. Pilates, which is training that addresses flexibility, strength, and balance, has also been shown to have a positive beneficial effect in um, hypertension patients. There can be a significant reduction in blood pressure even just after a 60 minute, one 60-minute Pilates uh, episode. Even Tai Chi which is an internal Chinese martial art with practiced for defense training, health benefits, and meditation. There's trials demonstrating uh, the benefit on the over overall uh, lipid profile and uh, helps in patients with high blood pressure. Yoga, which is my second love only to my orange theory addiction, is a group of physical, mental, and spiritual practices or disciplines which originated in ancient India. There has been a meta-analysis of 37 randomized controlled trials demonstrating that uh, there's a beneficial effect on lipid profile, BMI, uh, and blood pressure in those who practice yoga. There was another meta-analysis in 2019 of 49 trials that showed uh, moderate reductions in systolic and diastolic blood pressure in those who practiced yoga. When the practice includes breath work or meditation three times per week, there's a greater blood pressure reduction. Speaking of breath work, what about stress? Does stress increase your risk of heart attack? My doctor told me to avoid any unnecessary stress, so I didn't open his bill. This is very interesting uh, data obtained after the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. They looked at um, a little over 400 people um, coming in in the um, couple of months after the attack uh, presenting to the ER with uh, cardiovascular complaints and compared those to uh, a, a similar amount of matched controls that had come in for the two months leading up to the terrorist attack. And what they found that there was a 35% increase in heart attack and a 40% increase in cardiac arrhythmia. The rate of unstable angina, which is basically cardiac chest pain that has not quite led to a heart attack, actually decreased. The investigators hypothesized that that was because the people coming in with unstable angina before the 9-11 attack were much more likely to actually progress to serious legitimate cardiovascular um, event after the stress of the attack. This was a very large study published in Lancet, which is a very respectable medical journal. It's called the InterHeart. It looked at almost 25,000 people in 52 countries and found that patients who experience a high level of psychological stress were more than twice as likely to suffer a heart attack. They determined that psychological stress is an independent risk factor for heart attack, similar in heart damaging effect to the more commonly measured cardiovascular risks like blood pressure or cholesterol or diabetes. This study looked at almost a thousand patients, a third of them were women. They followed them for five years after having a cardiac event and they divided them into people who had a heart attack that was thought to be uh, mentally stress induced compared to those who just kind of had the classic heart attack not really related to stress and they followed them for five years and what they found was that the people that had the mental stress induced event were two to two and a half times more likely to suffer cardiovascular death and non-fatal MI in the subsequent five years and were twice as likely to be hospitalized for heart failure than those who had a heart attack that was not associated with extreme mental stress. But even though we don't like to admit it, we know that it's not stress.
stress that kills us. It's our reaction to it. Maureen Killeran said, stress is not what happens to us. It is our response to what happens to us. And our response is something we can choose. Stress resiliency is how you choose to not let the stressful events that enter your life affect your physiology. It is the ability to recognize and acknowledge that a situation has become difficult or painful and to choose a response that actually leads to growth. These are many different practices that can improve stress resiliency, meditation, relaxation response, EMDR is excellent for trauma processing and getting the trauma um, out of our bodies, neurofeedback, biofeedback, mindful breathing, guided imagery. There's so much data to support a mindfulness practice and its benefit. This is one particular study which looked at um, transcendental uh, meditation and a couple other things. And what it showed is that there was a significant reduction in both systolic and diastolic blood fresh pressure in uh, people who regularly participated in transcendental med meditation. This study in Circulation, which is one of the major cardiovascular uh, journals, uh, looked at uh, 200 black men and women who already had coronary disease and they randomized them to a routine uh, regular meditation program versus just doing some health education and they followed them for 5.4 years and found a 48% reduction in all-cause mortality and MI and stroke in those people who participated in the meditation arm. Shiran Yoku, I love this. It's called forest bathing. It's making contact with and taking in the atmosphere of the forest. There were field experiments uh, done in 280 subjects across 24 forests in Japan, and basically they just compared walking around in the forest versus walking in a city area. And what they found was that Shiron Yoku was associated with lower concentrations of cortisol, the stress hormone, lower pulse rate, lower blood pressure, increased parasympathetic, which is the restorative part of our nervous system, and lower sympathetic nerve ac activation, which is that fight or flight. Again, there are hundreds of studies showing benefits of various mindfulness practices. It's been shown to decrease blood pressure, it improves your ability to stop smoking, it improves insulin resistance, uh, endothelial dysfunction, which is the major component in high blood pressure. There's data demonstrating primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Our life is shaped by our mind. What we become, we become what we think. Buddha said that. In my practice, my um, preference for the mindfulness practice is heart math. There is this um, very dynamic heart-brain connection. It is little known that the heart actually sends more signals to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. These signals have a significant effect on brain function, influencing emotional processing, as well as higher cognitive faculties such as attention, perception, memory, and problem solving. Heart rate variability is the naturally occurring beat-to-beat -beat variation in our heart rate. It's an important indicator of health and fitness. It's a marker of biological aging and a marker of physiologic resilience and behavioral flexibility. Our heart rate variability reflects our ability to adapt effectively to stress and environmental demands. Incoherence is a state that is caused by emotions such as anger, frustration, and anxiety, and it gives rise to a heart rhythm pattern that appears irregular and erratic. It's pathologic, it causes disease. Coherence is generated by uplifting emotions such as appreciation, joy, care, and love, and it generates a pattern that is smooth, a harmonious wave, and it's healthier. Breathing patterns that we can participate in help modulate the heart's rhythm and help modulate coherence and incoherence. It's possible to generate a coherent heart rhythm simply by breathing slowly and regularly. Heart math is a very scientifically validated uh, program that uses uh, techniques uh, such as mindful breathing, guided imagery, and biofeedback to improve our resilience. This is what I actually um, promote in my practice, and I hope that later on in the year I'll actually um, be launching a heart math program where people can um, come in and be coached on this. So let's try some quick coherence for one minute. 
I want you to feel your feet on your fl the floor and your seat on your seat. And if you're comfortable, just close your eyes. Slow your breathing and focus your attention into the area of your heart. Imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or your chest area, breathing a little slower and a little deeper than usual. You can count your inhales and exhales if you want, inhaling and exhaling for a count of four or five, all the while focusing your attention in the area of your heart. Now I want you to activate a positive or renewing feeling, thinking about a time in your life that you were very happy, or thinking of a person or a pet that truly gives you joy. And imagine yourself with that person or in that situation again, living that very joyful event and all the while breathing into your heart area. Good. I would love to um, keep you in this meditation practice for five minutes or more, but um, alas, I have to move on. I still have a lot of slides to get through. This um, graph here demonstrates what happened to your heart rate variability and other physiologic parameters while you were doing that quick coherence technique. This shows that after five minutes of doing that exercise that we just performed, uh, this particular person went from this state of complete incoherence, remember the jaggy, um, irregular nature, to this more coherent um, sine wave smooth type pattern. This is way healthier than this. And doing this regularly, a few times a day, every day, um, can increase, it can improve your heart rate variability and decrease your overall risk for de disease. Self-awareness is the ability to take an honest look at your life without any attachment to being right or wrong or good or bad. We all need to practice more self-awareness. Let's move on and talk about sleep. Sleep affects processes that keep your heart and blood vessels healthy, including those that affect your blood sugar, blood pressure, and inflammation levels. It plays a vital role in your body's ability to heal and repair not only the blood vessels of the heart and the heart, but repeal, repair and healing occurs everywhere during sleep. People who don't sleep enough are more likely to get cardiovascular disease. Insomnia has actually been linked to an increased risk of heart attack and stroke, and poor sleep can lead to other unhealthy habits that cause heart damage, including high stress, less motivation to be physically active, and unhealthy food choices. None of us want to go make a salad when we're tired. Adults who sleep less than seven hours each night are more likely to have high blood pressure, type two diabetes, and obesity. It's during normal sleep that our blood pressure goes down. And if we're not sleeping, then our blood pressure just stays higher a longer uh, part of the time, like a higher percentage of our life. Type two diabetes uh, can occur in those that do not sleep well. This is a condition that damages um, your blood vessels. Some studies show that getting enough sleep might help people improve blood sugar control. And poor sleep leads to obesity. Lack of sleep can lead to unhealthy weight gain. This is especially true in children and adolescents who need more sleep than adults. Not getting enough sleep may affect a part of the brain that controls hunger. Insomnia can also lead to an early death. Have you ever met those people that say, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead? Well, they might get that nap sooner than they thought. There was a study at the University of Arizona that included almost 1,500 people with persistent or intermittent insomnia compared to those without insomnia, and they followed them for 20 years. And they found that the ones with persistent insomnia lasting six or more years had, were at increased risk of dying from cardiovascular or lung disease or from any cause compared to people without insomnia, even when adjusted for other cardiovascular risk factors. Intermittent insomnia did not increase one's risk of death. There was another meta-analysis from 2010 that included over a million people that were followed between 4 and 25 years, and they found that a chronic sleep duration of less than 5 hours per night is associated with a 12% increased risk of dying from any cause. So find a way to sleep. 
The sweet spot seems to be between seven and nine hours per night. I didn't present it here, but there is data suggesting that too much sleep can be detrimental to your health. He says, I just don't feel right unless I get my normal eight hours of semi-conscious drifting in and out of sleep. It's kind of the way I feel. All right, we're going to uh, change gears here and talk about the elephant in the room, which is going to be your cholesterol, because you all thought that's what this talk was going to be about, right? If we're going to talk about um, heart health in women. She says, I'm low carb, high fat with high cholesterol, so let's keep it quiet, okay? And the elephant says, no, let's talk about it. I want you to know and to believe that your LDL is not your destiny. Your LDL is that bad cholesterol that a lot of people in conventional medicine seem to um, hang their hat on. The doctor says, whenever your cholesterol gets too high, a sensor will send out a signal that automatically locks the kitchen door and turns on your treadmill. I'm going to tell you about my patient Christine here and through a couple case reports, you'll see how my approach might be a little different than the conventional approach when it comes to looking at your cholesterol and other risk factors. So Christine is 60, early 60s, um, who has a family history of cardiovascular disease. So she went to see a cardiologist to um, make sure that everything, she was doing all the right things. And he did this uh, standard lipid panel and he found that lo and behold, her LDL, the bad cholesterol is 135, which is tagged as an abnormal high. I copied and pasted this care plan straight from his note where he said that he discussed beginning Lipitor 10 milligrams orally at night as the LDL is recommended to be less than 100. In fact, he did not discuss this with Christine. He just reviewed the labs and sent a prescription to her pharmacy. Her pharmacist is actually a functional trained pharmacist who thought this was concerning and called Christine, hey, we got this prescription for a statin, you know, did your doctor talk to you about it? And he hadn't. So she decided to come to see me for a second opinion. I always take a deeper dive into my integrative cardiology uh, patient's lipids and do advanced lipid testing where I fractionate out the cholesterol to get a better look at that LDL. And as you can see, yes, it is 135. Her total cholesterol is 222, which I think in general, everybody could agree is not normal. But what I do show here is that she has a low particle number and her particles are large, not small. This is an LDL pattern type A which actually does not increase one's risk of cardiovascular disease. Basically, she has a lot of large, fluffy LDL and not thousands of teeny, tiny, atherogenic LDL. So she doesn't actually have the bad, bad kind of cholesterol. Lipoprotein A is actually a genetic, uh, genetically predetermined um, marker that also gives information about one's cardiovascular risk. So before ever initiating statin in any of my patients, I go to the CV risk calculator. This is online, available to everybody. Um, it's been uh, formulated from numerous uh, trials, actually mostly statin trials, um, looking at 10-year uh, cardio, cardiovascular um, risk in patients. I plug in her gender um, and multiple other physiologic parameters that help determine her risk, and we determine that her 10-year cardiovascular risk of having a myocardial infarction or a stroke is only 2.5%. 7.5% is kind of that magic number where the data would suggest that the benefit of statins outweigh the risk. Anything less than 5% is considered low risk. In general, it's not recommended we initiate statin therapy for a risk less than 7.5%. Just to show you an example, I take it one step further and I use this thing called the statin decision aid for my patients so that they can get a visual and see if I do take this medication, what is going to be the benefit? You can see these two out of these hundred people that will have a heart attack or stroke with Christine's parameters over the, when followed over the next 10 years. If they both decide to take a statin 
it will prevent one of them from having their event. So let's, uh, before we go back to Christine, talk about the other elephant in the room, which is 